Morning, everyone. Nice to see you. We're reading from Acts chapter 28, from 23 to the end. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. From morning till evening, he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Some were convinced of what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made his final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth and your forefathers when he said through Elijah the prophet, go to his people and say, you will ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never preserving. For this people's heart has become callous. They may hear with their ears and they may close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their ear, eyes, hear from their ears, understand from their hearts, and turn, and I will heal them. Therefore, I want to know that God's salvation has seen in the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him boldly and outstanding hindrance. He preached the gospel, the kingdom of God, and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, I'll ask Tim to come up. So I can just uh, pray for Tim as he prepares to, to talk to us today. Lord, just help us to take in those that reading we've done, that, that uh, Bob's just done, to pray that during this talk from Tim that we can, we do open our eyes and hearts and ears to him, and they're not closed, and we can get the message that Tim wants and the message from you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Well, we've made it. We've made it to the end of Acts. If you remember, we started out on our journey at the beginning of January. We were looking towards a month of looking at the vision and where the Lord is wanting to take Christchurch in 2020 and beyond. And before we go any further, I just want to say to each and every one of you, thank you. Thank you that you have been involved in this last month. Thank you that you've been praying about the vision. Thank you that you've filled in those questionnaires and that you've filled them in really honestly. Thank you for all the conversations that have been going on around this place and in small groups, out in the foyer, or wherever those conversations have been going. We're at the end of January. Well, we're actually in February now, aren't we? We're at the end of our reading through Acts. We, we, but I don't want any of this to stop. I don't want us to stop having these conversations. I don't want us to stop praying about the vision. I don't want us to stop talking to one another about where we see the church might be going. Because we've done that month, but the hard work really starts now. And without those continued prayers, without those continued conversations, we ain't going to get to the end. Well, hopefully we'll never get to the end, because the end is when, we, when we're with the Lord. But I want those to continue. I want us to continue being honest with each other. Because as I've looked at all those questionnaires, as I've taken out all of the comments, the good, the what we can improve, and what you'd like to see us doing, I have over five and a half pages of comments from you. And that fills my heart with joy. I'd say about one and a half of them are positive. About two are where we can improve. And the rest, if a maths is right, is about one and a half or two, is about what else you'd like to see us doing. 
And I want to say to you this morning that as I've looked at those comments, there is a common theme that runs through most of them. So already at the end of January, start of February, where I'm starting to see some of those priorities start to sneak through in those comments as to where the Lord might be calling us in 2020 and beyond. The PCC will be meeting in a couple of weeks to pray into that, to look at those comments, to start discerning where is the Lord calling us, to start getting something down on paper, hopefully. But what it also shows is that us as a community of believers, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are of a similar mindset. Particularly as I looked at those strongly disagree to strongly agree, as I put them into uh, the spreadsheet that I've been given by the diocese. For most questions, at least half of you had the same answer. That is impressive. I expected it to be right across the board. But as I've looked through that, as I've distilled that, as I've prayed about it, it shows me one thing, that we're ready for change. That we are ready to see the Lord work in this place in ways perhaps we've not seen it before. And I say, bring it on. I am incredibly excited about what the Lord is going to do here. And I'm incredibly excited about how each of us are going to be involved in that. And how each of us are going to play our part in seeing more of the kingdom here in Bushmead. It's incredibly exciting. But as I say, this is also the point where we still need to come together as the body of Christ. We need to look how we can become a place that is welcoming, a place that is inviting, a place that people will, from the outside want to go, I want to know what's going on in that building and I want to be in there. That's some of the work that we've got to do. As Matt was speaking about last week, is it going to be that this building starts shaking with the Holy Spirit? Bring it on. Whatever it looks like, however the Holy Spirit turns up, however the Lord wants us to go, it will look amazing. It always does when the Lord shows up. And I believe we will see more of the Lord in this place as we journey on. I believe we will see those things of the Spirit. We will see those things that we've been reading about in the Acts of the Apostles. And do you know why I say that? Well, the week before last was actually probably one of the hardest weeks that I've had here as your vicar. I can see Wendy sort of trying not to smirk. She knows what happened. You know, lots of things were happening within the life of our church. It wasn't just that the heating wasn't coming on or the boiler wasn't getting up to temperature. We didn't have any hot water. It took a while to get the element out of the boiler. Poor Steve was there with all sorts of different tools. We had to have our EPCM to agree our accounts for 2017, which was quite late. There was so much going on that was really trying to to stop us that it was the enemy. And that, to me, shows that we are doing the right thing and that we are stepping in the right direction because he does not want us to succeed. But as Matt said, I can't remember if it was last Saturday or last Sunday, we're living in that time between D-Day and VE Day. I think I've got that the right way around. We're living in that time where the battle has been won, but it continues, but we are living in that victory. And as I looked at this passage in Acts that Bob read for us this morning, Tom Wright titles this section, The End is Where We Start From. The end of the act of the apostles is where we start from. That we is me and you. At the beginning of the passage, we have Paul giving his testimony about the kingdom of God. We can see that testimony is really powerful. And the thing with testimony is there is no right or wrong. Because it's our own personal experience of the Lord that counts. If I was to ask each of you, how did you come to faith? Then each of you would have a different story. Each of you would have a different understanding of the Lord. Each of you would have had a different experience from that point when you came to faith to the point where we are now. There is no right or wrong. And I always find that when we share testimony, it's a really moving experience. As you start to think, wow, the Lord's working in them in that way. 
or the Lord's working in them that way. It's really moving. And as we hear those different stories, we start to see the different aspects of the Lord's character come through. And we realize that there's no right or wrong way to go about praying. Some of us may pray sitting down with our eyes closed and our hands together as we were taught at school. Some of us may pray when we're driving. Some of us may pray when we're running or cycling. That's me. Some of us pray with our eyes open. Prayer ministry, we pray with our eyes open so we can see what the Lord is doing. There is no right or wrong way to pray either. Back to the passage anyway. But in in this passage of Acts, we've heard that some are persuaded and some weren't and they left. But Paul doesn't leave it there. If you notice, he has another go. He has another go at telling them the gospel. And interesting, when we speak to people about the gospel, when we try and introduce people to Jesus, the stats show that on average, someone needs to hear the gospel seven times before the eighth time when they accept it and they accept that Jesus is Lord. So Paul has another go. So we should also have another go. When perhaps that person in your family who you've been praying for to come to know the Lord keeps saying no, keeps saying no. Don't lose hope. Keep praying and have another go. It may be that you say something in a slightly different way the next time or that their circumstances have changed and they're ready to accept Jesus as Lord. And then if we look at the section in verse 26 to 27 that Paul uses from Isaiah, it's not dissimilar to today. A lot of people in our world have heard about God but they don't want to understand. A lot of people's hearts have become hard. A lot do not listen, and too many have closed their eyes. Our society is, it shows us that people are losing interest in one another. There doesn't seem to be that same sense of community any longer. We have to work really hard to create that community that used to come so naturally to each and every one of us. And that doesn't apply to just out there. Even within the church, even within this church, we have to work hard to be a community. We work hard at being a community here, yet there are people who still feel they don't belong. It goes back to that point that we have to to belong in and believe in. We create a space here in this church where people feel they can belong. Where as we welcome people in from outside, they come in and think, I can belong there. That's what we're after. It's not easy. Because we all come with our own expectations and ideas as to what a church community should look like. If I was to ask you, what does does church look like to you? Again, there'd be a myriad of different responses here. And in many ways, it's finding the medium between all that, those views that we all share to get that place where we can belong and move forward, the common ground where we move forward together. Because once we have that community in here where people feel they belong, we're a place that looks attractive to those on the outside. We're a place that people want to come to because people miss that sense of community in this world. And if they know they can find that in the church, let's welcome them in. When those people come into church, we'll start to see hearts being softened, ears and eyes being opened. We're a church that is open to the Lord. We're a church who seek the Holy Spirit. We're a church who wants to see lives transformed. We want to see the things of God happening in this place. Because when we see those things of God, we find faith is boosted. And when we're fired up to go and tell others. When I get back from New Wine and I've seen God at work in so many different ways during the week, my heart's on fire and I want to stand on the rooftop and shout it out to the entire world of what I've seen the Lord do. But that's just one week a year. I want us to be able to do that after every time we've met as a body of Christ, as the body of Christ. That we will see the Lord turn up. We will see things happen in church that we can then go out and shout about to the world. 
I want to see people come in to know the Lord in Bushmead. I hope you do too. Paul splits his audience in two. We see that there are those who are convinced and there's those who would not believe. Well, friends, we find that as we share the gospel, as we lift up the name of Jesus, we find people who say yes and people who say no. But we shouldn't get too caught up on those that say no. It happened to Paul. It'll happen to us. It would happen to the apostles. Jesus tells them when he sends them out in Luke 9, if people don't welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So we shouldn't be surprised when we find people saying no. We should do like the apostles and move on and not take it personally. It's something that's happened down the ages and it's something that will continue to happen. But we can try again. We can try again as we meet people. Tom Wright goes on to describe the ending of Acts as perhaps one of the strangest endings to any biblical book. Of course, there's a caveat to that. We have to eliminate the gospel of Mark as we know that part of that has, is inevitably missing because the Greek ends mid-sentence and that doesn't happen. But taking Mark aside, Tom Wright believes Acts is very strange because it's a, there's a coming together of cultures. There's Paul in Rome, in many ways arriving at the end of the program that was set out for us in Acts 1 verse 8. The gospel will reach the ends of the earth because Rome was felt to be the end of the earth in the, in the Roman times. There's sorrow and longing, but there's energy and there's vision. And Luke wants us to understand that after all Paul has been through as we've journeyed through Acts, he's in Rome. And the agenda set for the early church has, in principle, been accomplished. And what we find is that the people here are doing their best to sing the songs of the God of Israel in a strange and pagan land. So maybe the question is, how can they begin to feel at home where they are? Well, Paul knows the answer, but some cannot hear it. And in many ways, it can feel like we are living in a strange and pagan land now. Gone are the days of Christendom, when the country was Christian. Gone are the days when everyone knew the biblical narrative. Gone are the days when everyone knew the Bible stories, because everyone was taught them at Sunday school. We're living in a different world. We're living in in a world where most children don't know the Bible. Dare I say it, a lot of adults don't know the Bible. Maybe even some Christians have turned away from the Bible. And that, my friends, is extremely dangerous. I believe that the only way we're going to get Christianity back into the mainstream in this country is when we are biblical in our churches and biblical in our own lives. If we're not reading our Bibles, we're not going to know what the biblical standards and principles are that we need to live by. So for our Lent course, we're going to be doing the Bible course, which gives us a whole overview of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But it also gives us some tools to help us study the Bible and look at the different styles of writing in it, from the law to the prophets to wisdom to the gospels to the letters. It explains, it gives us the tools to equip us, to help us study the word of the Lord. As we read through the New Testament, we can see that everyone who writes in the New Testament knew their scriptures really well. They always quote from them. Of course, they only had the Old Testament, but they knew it well. Can the same be said for us in our culture today? Do we know our Bibles well enough? We know that those in the early church would go through the story of the people of Israel through Abraham, Moses, the Psalms, the prophets, and how it all fits in with the grand narrative of the people of Israel. It leads up to the Messiah who would suffer and rise from the dead. A Messiah who fulfills some of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And a Messiah which means we can know our Father in heaven. 
It all points towards the kingdom of God, which we know is not yet fully realized, but we know it is here now. It's the tension of the now and the not yet. And we get this passage from Isaiah about people not listening. It's heard earlier in Acts chapter 13. It's quoted by all the gospel writers. Paul has something similar in Romans. So it's clearly an important passage for the New Testament authors. And after the quote from Isaiah 6 in Acts, we get a little more of the story. But it's not a lot. Paul, for two whole years, stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, to me, that doesn't feel like an ending. I want to know what happens next. I want to know what happens in those two years when he's preaching without hindrance, when he's preaching to all these people. I want to know what happens. How many people would come to know the Lord? What difference was Paul's preaching making? Maybe Luke didn't want us to know what happened next. Maybe he didn't know himself. And actually, a good writer is always someone who leaves the reader wanting more. And I think Luke achieves that in Acts. Maybe it's that Jesus is now being boldly, proclaimed boldly and without hindrance that sums up the book. Maybe it's Luke declaring that the kingdom of God has been decisively inaugurated on earth. After all, through the journeys that we've read about this month, the trials, the pain, the puzzles, the sufferings, and the shipwrecks, the gospel hasn't been stopped. The book shows us what is to come in some ways by not saying anything. That the gospel will continue to reach out into the future, beyond Rome, beyond the first century, beyond all the different people who've been mentioned throughout the book. And that, my friends, is where we come in. It draws us in. It draws me and it draws you into that grand narrative. The act of the apostles continues today and will continue long after our time. It reminds us that we ourselves are part of this cast of characters that are written about in this book. It reminds us that as we continue to proclaim Jesus Christ in the 21st century, the journey is ours. The trials and vindications are ours. The sovereign presence of Jesus is ours. We can pick it up. We can continue the story. Luke's writing, like Paul's journey, has reached its end. But in that end, it's where we begin. So a question for you this morning is, how well do we tell the story? Paul had a few years of story and testimony to share with the Gentiles to help them believe in Jesus. We have over 2,000 years of things that the Lord has been doing to help people believe in him. We have a huge wealth of information that we can use to introduce people to the Lord. We can look back at different events in history, the revivals that have happened down the centuries, the miracles that take place daily. We have so much to refer to. But we also have something that is probably the most important thing in all of this. We each have our own testimony. We each have our own story of what the Lord has done in our lives. And when we meet people, we can share those stories. Yes, we can share the big stories. We can share the stories of everything that goes on. But a lot of people, often their response is, well, that's all well and good, but that's in the past. Or, well, that's really big. That was expected there. But when we sit down with somebody and say to them, this is what the Lord has done for me, we can say it with conviction. We can say it because we know it's true. We can say it because it's happened to us. And it's in those stories, that we, the ones that we have lived, the moment when we first encountered Jesus, that we can share with people. Because we can remember what it's like 
If we've received healing from the Lord, we remember what it's like before that healing. If we've been praying so hard for something that's not happened, we can share, we know that frustration. If we've prayed for something that seems so far out of reach, so beyond our, what we ever imagined, and yet it's come true, we can share that. And because it's happened to us, we share it with passion. And there is real power in our story. And there is real power in the church when we share those stories of what the Lord is doing. And I wonder, have we become too afraid to share our stories? Have we become worried that people won't want to listen to what we have to say? Have we come, become worried that we'll be told that it's offensive to share Jesus Christ with those whom we know? Well, I believe, friends, that the time has come where we have to take a stand and we have to say enough is enough. And we have to proclaim the word of Jesus Christ in this nation once again. And if we can speak about Jesus once again, do so as Paul did in this passage, boldly and without hindrance. Imagine the difference it might make. Imagine the difference it might make to Bushmead, to Luton, to this nation. The Greek that Luke uses about boldness is the word parasias. I always said I'd never use Greek in a sermon, but he uses the word parasias. And it's a characteristic word throughout the book of Acts, if you look at the Greek. Ever since the twelve exhibited boldness and prayed for more in Acts chapter 4. That word comes up time and time again. And it denotes speech which is candid, with no concealment of the truth. It denotes speech that is clear, with no obscurity of expression. And it denotes speech which is confident, with no fear of consequences. So imagine, friends, if we, like Paul, were able to speak candidly, clearly, and confidently without worry. Imagine if we spoke like that with one another in the church. Imagine if we spoke like that outside the church. That if we started to speak boldly the word of God in this nation, if we did it without concealing anything, in a language that people understand and confidently, without fear of being told we're going against political correctness, what difference would that make to the church? Because at so many levels out there, I know we have to be guarded about what we say and how we say it. Sometimes we end up unintentionally distorting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know we never set out to intend to do that. But what we need to be doing is preaching from this book. We need to be speaking from this book outside in the nation. And if it's not in this book, then we shouldn't be speaking it. So I have another question for you this morning. When was the last time you spoke boldly for the Lord? Maybe the next question is, actually, or the first question, when was the last time you asked God for boldness to proclaim the gospel? And I'll be honest with you this morning, when I asked myself those questions, I didn't like the answer. So don't feel bad. So how do we do this when we fear that anything we say might be misconstrued? Or when we fear that what we say might lead us into trouble? We posture ourselves before the Lord because we can only do it in his strength. The disciples didn't speak boldly unless they'd been intentional about it and prayed for the Holy Spirit to help them. So we need to humble ourselves before the Lord to pray for boldness, to proclaim the gospel, to Bushmead, to Luton, to wherever our spheres of influence take us. You might think, well, I don't have any influence in who I see, but let me tell you this. If you walk out of your house, you've got influence. Heck, maybe even within your house, you've got influence if there are people who don't know the Lord. So I challenge you this morning, and I challenge me, to start proclaiming the gospel boldly once again. Imagine 
if we took this seriously, if the, if the church takes this seriously and starts speaking out truth once again? What if there's a Luke in this congregation who decides to write up the story of what we did in 2,000 years ago, and 2,000 years in the future, if somebody's reading Acts of the Apostles version 2, or probably version 2002 by then, and at the end of it, it says, Steve preached for two years boldly and without hindrance the gospel of the Lord. Chris preached boldly and without hindrance the gospel of the Lord. Helen preached boldly and without hindrance the gospel of the Lord. Just imagine that. Would it read like Acts? That people prayed so hard and then they went out and did the work of Jesus? Or would it read that, well, they tried, didn't get very far, so they stopped and retreated into the church building? How would it look? I don't want that to sound negative when we come back into the church building. But are we as a church guilty of it? We try, we fail, we retreat. What happened to try again? When did fear get in the way? When did fear get hold of us so much that we stopped wanting to go out and declare the name of the Lord? Friends, Paul ended up in prison because of his passion for the Lord. Now we might not end up in prison, but we might, we we will face opposition. Not just opposition from the world, but from the enemy too. That's when we need to stand up and declare that the battle has already been won. Paul was shipwrecked in Acts 27. Everything seemed lost. It felt as though Paul was not going to get where he was supposed to be going. Yet Paul never lost hope. Because he'd been promised by the Lord in Acts 23 that he would get to Rome. So I wonder, where have we lost hope? Perhaps we're facing our own shipwreck. When we've got to that point of feeling completely helpless, without any hope of being able to proclaim the gospel once again. If you're sitting here this morning without hope, let me tell you this. There is hope in Jesus Christ. If you're sitting here this morning thinking, what can I do? There is hope in Jesus Christ. Without getting into a political debate over Brexit, if you feel that all has been lost, if you feel that all has been won, let me tell you this, whichever side of the debate you're on, there is hope in Jesus Christ. For Paul, there was hope in Jesus. He came through adversity. He then went and preached boldly without hindrance the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I know this church has had its fair share of difficulties over recent years. But let me tell you this, Christ Church, this morning, that as we press into discerning the Lord's vision for this church, there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope that we will go out into the world and proclaim the gospel boldly. There is hope in Jesus Christ. And why do I say that? Because it's right here in Scripture. Amen.